Lovers, they're the worst. They'll murder you, so don't have one. <laughs> Hello, true crimers. Sorry if the camera seems a little shaky. I'm holding my phone with my own hands like a schlub uh, because my little claw thingy uh, appears to be broken. So we got to figure out a solution to that uh, ASAP. But anyway, um, because I'm fat and I can't hold my phone up too long without sweating and having a heart attack because, again, I'm 800 pounds overweight, we're just going to get right into it because this is actually a hella long video again, probably close to two hours, maybe a little under. It'll be, it'll be under two hours, but uh, this will have... I'm having a stroke. 35 videos. 35 videos where the culprits were uh, lovers, stalkers, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, that kind of thing. Um, I feel like I'm Blair Witch right now. Ah, you kicked the map! Okay, sorry. Uh, so, anyway, <laughs> without further ado, um, here are 360,000 more videos for you to watch with your faces. Or just listen with your ear holes. I don't know what you do in your life. It's not my business. Viewer discretion is advised. Bing, bong, bong. This is a story where a woman would solve her own murder. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Sandra Deist. Viewer discretion is advised. Sandra was born on December 29th, 1959, and she lived in Michigan her whole life. She would later go on to marry an insurance salesman by the name of David Deist, and then the two of them would have three kids together. Sandra absolutely loved horses, and behind their home, they had some stables with horses. On November 19th, 1998, Sandra had run over to a neighbor's house with, like, blood coming from her head. She told them that her horse had kicked her in the head and she needed help. The incident would create issues with her uh, brain, basically. She suffered migraines, she had cranial nerve damage, she began to fall into a depression, which would lead to basically the marriage kind of having cracks. And uh, yeah, because Mr. David here was having an affair with uh, a secretary of his. This woman here, Linda Ryan. Fucking Linda. On March 29th, 2000, oh good, that's my birthday, police would be called to the diced home because allegedly Sandra had ended her own life with a gun. She did so with a gun that was registered in David's name. It was a 9mm. David said he was in the living room watching a show, kind of half asleep. He then heard the gunshot, he ran, and then he found his wife. By the way, he said, one gunshot. I mention that because Sandra was actually shot twice through the head. Sandra had no gunshot residue on her hand. She had no blood spatter anywhere on her hand or body. Now, a self-unaliving with two gunshots is extremely rare. It almost never happens, but it has happened before, mainly due to a gun misfiring. But experts would say that each shot, one or the other, either one of them would have incapacitated Sandra, meaning the second shot she could not have physically done. They also tested the gun. They fired it multiple times and it never had a misfire or a second shot go off like some guns have done before. They also determined that each bullet came from a slightly different direction. David's shirt that he was wearing or a sweatshirt had blood spatter on it. He said that's because when he got to the room, Sandra had coughed on him, which is possible. Coughing up blood could create this exact pattern. Sandra's sister then dropped a bombshell. She said she had spoken to Sandra recently and told her that if anything happens to me, there is a letter hiding behind a dresser and I need you to open it in case something happens. And lo and behold, there was an envelope with this exact letter. Towards the bottom of the letter, it would say this. I could never, ever take my own life. Never. If anything happens to me, Please take a closer look at David Deist. He could be 
my killer. Her letter would also reveal something else shocking. Remember when I told you about the horse kicking her in the head? It wasn't a horse at all. She goes on to say in the letter that her husband, David, struck her over the head with the butt of an axe, and that is what caused her injuries. Now, there was no way of going back and physically proving that, so this is just, you're taking her word for it. And Sandra basically had found out about her husband's infidelity. David would go on to say that Sandra actually was, uh, she had attempted self on a lighting before. She battled with depression for years. What would be David's motive if he was the one who killed her? Well, Linda. And also a $500,000, you guessed it, life insurance policy. He sold life insurance. So it's not uncommon for life insurance salespeople to buy their own life insurance policy because that's what they have to sell. So he didn't take out this policy like a week before her murder or anything, but he did stand to benefit from this greatly. So he was arrested and charged with her murder. And when his kids took the stand to testify, they were actually supposed to be testifying in his defense. But unknowingly, they told the uh, lawyers that that day they heard not one shot, like David said, but they did hear two shots go off one right after the other, which would obviously be confirmed when she had two bullet holes in her head. The evidence against David was overwhelming. But ultimately, it would be this letter that drove police in the right direction. This was the victim telling everyone exactly what happened. And it's, it's just so, uh, it's haunting that she even had to write this letter. But I, you know what? Thank goodness she did. In March of 2001, David Deist was convicted of the murder of his wife, Sandra. He would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But in 2008, he died in prison at the age of 58. Wah, wah. She would be killed because of $20. <sighs> Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Michelle Hoffman Tam. Viewer discretion is advised. The 51-year-old Michelle lived in Rotorua in New Zealand. Michelle was friends with this woman, Gwenda Sloan, for about 20, 25 years or so. And they had like this sort of on again, off again, sexual relationship as well. That relationship had been described as becoming more extreme towards 2012. On November 7th, 2012, Michelle had gone over to uh, Gwenda's house um, when Gwenda had texted her. Quote, hello, my little monkey, want to have some fun, end quote. So Michelle had gone over to Gwenda's and the two of them reportedly went out to like a convenience store to get three cases of beer. But Michelle never got home um, that night or the following day. So she would be reported missing and Gwenda at first wasn't really cooperating. Gwenda was questioned by police multiple times in that first couple of weeks, but nothing ever came from it. Then police went back to her on November 22nd and she finally just caved in and she would end up telling police where the body of Michelle was located. This is because Gwenda had murdered her that night. According to Gwenda, the two of them got their alcohol and then they went back to the house and drank a lot. And then all of a sudden an argument broke out and Gwenda reacted by stabbing Michelle. Using two different knives, she stabbed her 33 times. She then cut off Michelle's ears and shoved one of them into her mouth. Police had to wonder what, what happened. Well, one, Gwenda said she was they drunk, and she had assumed that Michelle stole a $20 note from her purse, something that wasn't actually true. So she reacted, they got into a fight, and that's why she killed her for something that didn't happen. Gwenda then buried her body and tried to get away with it, but I guess her conscience got the better of her. So she was arrested and charged with the murder, and she would end up getting convicted of that murder. 
She would be sentenced to life in prison where she could get paroled after 17 years. This was someone who Michelle had introduced to, you know, Michelle's kids and grandkids. They called her Aunt Gwenda, but they also in the back of their minds always knew something was a little off with her. They tried to get Michelle to get away from her, but sadly it didn't happen. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Mike and Missy McIver. Viewer discretion is advised. Mike and Susan Imel, and she actually would go by Missy, they met sometime in 1987. They hit it off really quickly. They started to date, and then eventually, a couple years later, they would get married. Mike flew planes, um, and he also liked to renovate old planes, kind of like a side thing. And Missy was a third grade teacher. The couple would eventually move to Tavernier Keys, which is in Florida. And a year or so after they got married, Missy, she got pregnant and they were very excited. This was something they had been wanting to do for a while. On August 21st, 1991, a huge tropical storm hits the Florida Keys and it went on for hours and hours and hours that night. The following morning, um, people had tried to reach out to Mike and Missy just to see how they were doing, but no one could get a hold of them. Missy was expected at a meeting here at her uh, elementary school job and she didn't show up, which is very unlike her. They tried calling her and again, they got no response. So some friends and neighbors would go over to their home and they would try knocking on the door and again, no one answered. Then they peered inside the window and when they did, they saw Mike's like uh, foot. Um, and then so a neighbor had basically just busted the door down and that's when they found his body uh, surrounded by blood. So when police arrived, they confirmed that Mike was deceased on the living room floor. They then went to the bedroom where they discovered the deceased body of Missy. Mike had tape all around his face and it appeared after the autopsy that he had his neck broken, possibly by someone stepping on or kicking his throat. Missy was tied up, she was strangled to death, and she was sexually assaulted. And unfortunately, the baby would be deceased as well. Police originally thought, well, maybe this has something to do with Mike because he had flown back and forth to Brazil. So they thought, okay, drug angle, so it must be that. But they found out he purchased a plane in Brazil, it was all legal, and the drug connection was non-existent. When a profiler came in, they said, you should have been focusing on Missy. She was clearly the target because she was sexually assaulted. Well, they found out that Missy, like literally the day before, had told her sister that a gas station attendant was really creepy and tried to hit on her. They would find out his name was Thomas Overton. But because they had no physical evidence to connect him to the crime, they couldn't arrest him. And he denied doing the double homicide, of course. But there was DNA left on Missy, so, but they couldn't collect his DNA legally. As a matter of fact, it took years to even get DNA from this man, and they had to do it in kind of a tricky way. So they basically got to a point where they found out through a friend that he was planning to commit a robbery on a home. So the police organized a sting operation. They followed him to this home, and they caught him in the act of burglarizing it. And on his possession, he had a weapon, which means they could charge him with a felony. And so with that, they were going to be able to collect his blood. But before they could even do that, he took a razor and he tried cutting his own throat. And he did so because he was planning to escape from the medical uh, center, not because he wanted to end his own life. But also, little did he know, when he cut his throat, he left his blood all over the prison cell. So police were able to collect it, and therefore they were able to test it against the male bodily fluid that was left on Missy. And it was a match. And it turns out this wasn't even the first murder he was a suspect of. But apparently the other murder, they had nothing to connect him. There wasn't even DNA. So from what I understand, they weren't able to prosecute him for this other murder of a young woman after she was found dead, like leaving a movie theater that he worked at. So he was finally charged with the murder of Missy and Mike McIver, as well as their unborn child. 
He, in court, would be really creepy. At one point, he turned to the families watching the trial and gave them a really creepy smile. Uh, yeah. But he would be found guilty of all three counts of murder, so he would be sentenced to death. Oh, raspberries. He is still, believe it or not, awaiting his execution. And apparently this is what he looks like now. Okay. Those are those current glasses we could find. Okay. She was so excited to become a mother, but then he took that all away from her. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kelly Fovrell. Viewer discretion is advised. Kelly was a beautiful, selfless, caring 26-year-old woman. She lived in Thornton Heath, which is in England. Now, in 2018, 2019, she had been dating this man by the name of Aaron McKenzie. And Kelly would end up becoming pregnant with her first child with Aaron. But Aaron appeared to have some issues. He was a very jealous person. He had anger problems and he clearly needed some kind of just help. It got to a point where Kelly just did not want to be involved with him anymore unless it had to do specifically with their child. So she had broken it off with him and I can't, I don't know if she started to date someone else or not. I see some stories that say she did and some that don't even mention it. But regardless, the breakup itself did not go so well with Aaron. Kelly had described the relationship as being very toxic and she had texted him like, you know, can you please go, you know, get some help. But anything to do with our baby, our baby boy, Riley, when he is here, you know, we will work this out and we will, you will be able to see your son. But as far as me and you go, it just needs to be over. In the overnight hours of June 29th, 2019, Kelly was asleep in her bed and she was eight months pregnant with her baby boy, Riley. When all of a sudden her family who also lived there heard horrible screams coming from her room. By the time the family got into her bedroom, she had been stabbed many times and the person who did it didn't appear to be there anymore. Although this person was caught on CCTV running away from the home. And when paramedics arrived, unfortunately they pronounced Kelly dead at the scene. They were able to take baby Riley um, out through a cesarean, but unfortunately he would also die later at the hospital. After some investigation, police would end up arresting Aaron McKenzie for the murder of his ex-girlfriend and the manslaughter of his own child. At one point, he confessed to it to police, but then he rescinded and said, I'm insane, I'm crazy, I'm very depressed, that's what happened. Someone else did it, but the jury wouldn't buy it. He was found guilty of both of their murders. He got 35 years to life for Kelly, an additional 20 years for Riley, and then a few extra years for having the knife. Jesus. The end result of this case is actually incredibly infuriating to me. And it is the case of Olivia Rossi. Viewer discretion is advised. Olivia was a beautiful, vivacious 23-year-old girl who lived in Westland, Michigan. She was described as having like a really strong personality, but at the same time, a super loving, very nurturing and caring personality. She was described by friends and family as having a beautiful soul and someone who would just make the best friend possible. I firmly believe that you can see how genuine a human being is, even in a photograph. And I see someone who is very gentle and someone that I would have been honored to be friends with. But unfortunately, the world was robbed of any of that. This was her 26-year-old, I guess, friend slash... Uh, sometimes boyfriend, acquaintance, Anthony Kesselloot. On August 18th, 2019, Anthony was with Olivia at his home. Olivia, who has a twin sister, um, when she left the house that night, her sister, twin, had a, you know, almost like a, a feeling of, please don't go. And she recalls just sort of that last moment of like, 
their hands touching and, you know, her sister just having a really bad feeling and that would end up becoming true. Anthony Kesselute would claim that Olivia then left his house and went back to her home, but she never got home. And Olivia's family just wasn't buying it that he had no idea where she was. But the answers to where she was would come to them on August 23rd, 2019. They found her body wrapped in a blanket and stuffed inside like a, a hamper and then just sort of discarded on the side of, you know, this road here. I don't understand how a person can murder, but for some reason, I more don't understand how a person just throws a person away like they're garbage. Like, I just... I can't, I don't understand. Olivia had been strangled to death. Anthony claims that that night they had sex, they did drugs, and uh, and then I guess one thing led to another and he strangled her to death. And then he made the decision to put her in a blanket, put her in a hamper, and then dump her and pretend like nothing happened. What I don't understand is this. So he was charged with open murder, which basically that means it's you can go back between first and second degree murder. The jury can choose. And he acknowledges the murder, but he only got five to 15 years. He stole a woman's life 10 days before her birthday, by the way. And somehow he gets to enjoy the rest of his life. Hello, true crimers. Just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up. This case deals a lot with domestic violence so it may be triggering to some. This is the case of Carrie Culberson. Viewer discretion is advised. Carrie lived in Blanchester, Ohio, which is about 30 miles away from Cincinnati. Her parents were divorced, but she lived with her mother. At the time of the story, she was working uh, back and forth between two different nail salons, and she was dating a man by the name of Vincent Doan. His friends and family would describe him as being super friendly and uh, polite and would never lay a hand on anyone. He was described as a pretty sensitive guy. But that's not what Carrie and her family saw in Vincent. The two of them dated on and off for about three years or so. At first he was very clingy, I guess would be the word or perhaps looking to control her because he would call her at work five, six times every single day. And then it became physical. Carrie would come to work with black eyes. She had bruises around her temples. She had actual finger impressions on her throat. One of her coworkers who was washing her hair one day said she noticed there were medical staples in the back of her head. That is because Vincent hit her over the head with a space heater. He himself would later say that, yeah, he slapped her several times, but never with a fist. One time, Vincent said with regards to girlfriends, quote, well, you can't just let them walk. You have to make them pay. Carrie was in a horrible situation, and I have said it a million times, and I'll say it a million times more. Domestic abuse victims can't just simply stand up and say, okay, I'm done, I'm leaving. They're terrified for their lives. They've already been dealt the physical harm to their bodies. If they try to leave a person like that, well, allegedly Carrie tried to break up with him. At approximately six o'clock in the morning on August 29th, 1996, Carrie's mother would notice that Carrie's red vehicle, a Honda CRX, they were gone. There was no sign of Carrie, no sign of the car. The family would drive around everywhere to try to find her, but they came up with nothing. She would eventually be reported as missing. The last person to see her? Yep, Captain Mullet here. Witnesses would state that they saw Carrie's red vehicle and Carrie herself over at Vincent's place. Very early in the morning or late at night, however you want to say it, there was a ton of screaming. Witnesses saw him punching her in the street. And then, gone. Carrie has never been found. Her car has never been found. But he still went on trial for kidnapping and murder. He was convicted and got life without parole. But where is she? In this seemingly peaceful Greensboro, North Carolina neighborhood, a body would be removed from a backyard. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Cherie Jackson. Viewer discretion is advised. Cherie was a 27-year-old who lived in Greensboro, North Carolina. She was a family and healthcare coordinator. 
Back in high school, she was the prom queen. She was a cheerleader. She was also an honor student. She had a large group of friends and a big family. And, you know, everyone would say that she was just this big ray of sunshine in everyone's lives. On the night of November 29th, 2006, she was supposed to go to a friend's house for a big, like, post-Thanksgiving party. But she never showed up. The next day, DiCarlo Bennett, her boyfriend, would call her family saying, I haven't seen Shuri anywhere. Have you guys seen her? And they said, no, we haven't seen her. We haven't heard from her. The last the family saw Shuri was at Thanksgiving a week prior. And DiCarlo was there as well. So the family reports Shuri as missing because she never shows up to work. She never shows up to any other functions that she agreed to show up at. Police were questioning people in her life, especially, you know, ex-boyfriends. But it was DiCarlo that was really kind of confusing them. He would constantly change his story um, about the last time he saw her. And what's more is that police went to Cherie's apartment to see if they could find any clues. The apartment was in complete disarray. It was a mess. It looked like a struggle had taken place. When they sprayed the bathroom down with luminol, it basically lit up the room. There were definite signs that someone had cleaned up some blood. DiCarlo immediately went up the list of suspects. This is because he has a history of domestic violence against Cherie. On more than one occasion, police had to intervene to break up, you know, a fight that DiCarlo had started. And I've talked about this many times, it's when you're in that situation, you know, it's, it's not easy to just get up and leave. It's terrifying. You are afraid that they may try to kill you. Cherie reportedly was trying to get out of the relationship, however. But when neighbors heard a bunch of screaming and loud noises coming from her apartment one, you know, November 29th evening, police would end up charging him with murder, even though there was no body. That is until when they were questioning him, he agreed to take a plea deal. He would show them where her body was and he would take a deal for second degree murder. Here in this Greensboro neighborhood, a very quiet neighborhood, DiCarlo's grandmother used to live in a house here. Police asked the new owner of the house if they could dig in the backyard, and obviously they said yes, and they found the body of Cherie Jackson. It was 19 months after she went missing. His deal only got him 13 years in prison. He was just recently released. A man on a cruise ship would be asked, Where's your wife? He responds, She's dead. I killed her. Hello, true crimerers. This is the case of Shirley McGill. Viewer discretion is advised. By 2009, Shirley McGill was a 55-year-old woman who had just recently retired from the Department of Motor Vehicles. She was described as a very devoted mother, a loving grandmother, someone who just had a lot of energy. She was known for her love and devotion to animals. She was high school sweethearts with Robert McGill, and then after some time, the two of them would break up. But then decades later, they would meet up again and they would marry. Sounds almost like a storybook romance, but it would not end up that way. In July of 2009, Shirley and Robert would go on a cruise, specifically the carnival ship Elation. And this was a five day trip to Mexico. One of the reasons they did the cruise was because one of the days fell on Robert's 55th birthday. 55th? On July 14th, 2009, the ship would dock at Cabo. While in Cabo, Robert got very, very drunk. He was so intoxicated that other people on the ship said he could barely stand up on his two feet. It's believed he had at least 20 alcoholic beverages that day. And he would return to his stateroom that evening. Later, he goes onto one of the decks to smoke a cigar and have some more drinks with a couple that they had met on the ship. But it was just Robert there, so they asked him, Hey, where's Shirley? Where's your wife? He just stares at them and says, She's dead. I killed her. Okay? So, the crews was alerted immediately. When they looked inside the bathroom of the McGill stateroom, they found Shirley. She was lying on the ground and she had been just annihilated. He had absolutely just beat her and then he strangled her until she was dead. Why exactly did he do it? 
they must have gotten into an argument because he was like 98 sheets to the wind and he reacted the way he did. The crews would then dock in San Diego and the San Diego Police Department would board the ship and they would arrest Robert McGill. They would charge him with murder. At his trial, his defense would try to paint him as, you know, a saint because he helped so many troubled teens. That's kind of what he did for a living. But that doesn't negate what he did to his wife. Robert showed some small amount of remorse and Robert would be sentenced to life in prison without parole. A young pregnant woman in Colorado would go visit her boyfriend, but then she's never been seen since. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Kelsey Schelling. Viewer discretion is advised. On the morning of February 4th, 2013, 21-year-old Kelsey would go to the doctor to get her first sonogram of her baby. At the time of this story, she was about eight weeks pregnant. Now, Kelsey, she lived in Denver, Colorado, but her boyfriend and the father of her baby, he lived in Pueblo, Colorado. And that was about a two hour drive south for her. But that afternoon, she told friends and family that she was going down to visit her boyfriend. But after she got to Pueblo, she never made contact with anyone. Her cell phone would go straight to voicemail. Kelsey seemed to vanish. So Kelsey's family would report her missing. A few days later, on February 7th, 2013, outside of the St. Mary Corwin Medical Center in Pueblo, Colorado, Kelsey Schelling's vehicle would be found. It was a 2011 Chevy Cruze, so police asked the hospital if they could find the CCTV footage of the parking lot. And when they did, they found footage of an unidentified black male parking the car and then leaving it. This is Dante Lucas. He is the boyfriend of Kelsey Schelling. Police obviously questioned him and he told them that he was with Kelsey and the two of them had gone to a Walmart together. That she had gotten out of the car to go into Walmart to pick up some snacks. So police went to the Walmart to get the CCTV footage. Sure enough, just like he said, there's Kelsey's car being parked. The problem? Kelsey is never seen leaving the vehicle. Just Dante, that's it. He's then seen walking completely away from the car. The car is just sitting in the parking lot overnight for 18 hours. Kelsey never gets out of it. The next morning, lo and behold, an unidentified person walks up to her car and drives away. Kelsey's vehicle is then seen driving up to an ATM and the ATM camera would find that it was not Kelsey, but it looked like Dante Lucas. And then he left her car here at the hospital. Now, Kelsey, she's still never been found. Her belongings have never been found. When police seized her vehicle, they failed to really test it extensively for evidence. So there was no like DNA found, there was no fingerprints found. There is literally no trace of Kelsey anywhere. No trace to even indicate she had been possibly murdered. But obviously, I mean, it's 2022 now and she's still never been found. But even without a body, with a mountain of circumstantial evidence, they charged Dante with her murder. His defense team never called a witness. They figured the prosecution has no body, so, but he got convicted anyway. And he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Tori Minnick. Viewer discretion is advised. The outgoing and charming Tori was born in Pennsylvania in 1990. By 2011, she was going to college to obtain her nursing degree. She was described as someone who just really wanted to help other people. And at the same time, she was working at a rehab center. And there, she met Aaron Everett. The two of them became very close and eventually started a relationship. Prior to the story beginning, so about 2010 or so, Tori moved in with Aaron and Aaron was living with her parents, um, but Aaron had her own like section of the house in the basement. Shortly after Tori moved in, there were some fights, I guess you can say. You see, Tori had an ex-boyfriend named Cody Donaldson, and Aaron looked at Tori's cell phone one time and checked through her text messages and saw that Tori was still talking to Chris and that she was possibly thinking of leaving Aaron. Aaron would confront Tori about this and the two of them, you know, fought from time to time 
over all of it. On March 25th, 2011, Aaron would call the police with regards to a break-in. When the police arrived, they saw Tori at the bottom of a staircase. She was naked and there was just blood everywhere. She had been shot twice in the head with a 357 Magnum. And then the police also noticed it appeared her head had been like bludgeoned as well. Aaron told police it was an intruder and she even showed them the broken window. The problem with the broken window though, all the glass shards were on the outside of the house. I don't know if I need to explain this to you, but typically if someone's breaking into your home through a window from the outside, the glass shards should primarily be in the home, not on the outside. So police determined that this was clearly staged. Aaron must have broken the window um, from inside. And then in their investigation, police discovered the rift that was happening between Tori and Aaron with regards to the boyfriend. They also found text messages between Aaron and another friend of theirs. His name is William Nair. She had texted him, how do I load a gun? And where do I buy these types of bullets for this gun? So police arrested Aaron and charged her with the murder of Tori. And when confronted with all the evidence, she just confessed. Her defense team did not argue that she killed her. They said, yeah, she killed her. They tried to say it was a crime of passion. Tori was abusive, but there was no proof of that. So a judge sentenced Aaron to life in prison without the possibility of parole. A man would try to claim that his wife, uh, she fell overboard. No, the wind knocked her over. No, Israeli agents killed her. <sighs> Hello, true Kramerers. This is the case of Karen Waltz. Viewer discretion is advised. 26-year-old Karen Waltz was a physical therapist working in Florida in the 1980s, and she had met Dr. Scott Rolston, he was a chiropractor, when he had fallen down some stairs and needed some physical therapy. The two of them hit it off, and they would eventually become engaged. And on February 6th, 1988, the two of them got married. For their honeymoon, they decided to take a seven-day cruise to Mexico. At approximately 3 a.m. on Saturday, February 13th, 1988, Scott would report that his wife Karen had gone overboard. So, staff members on the Star Dancer cruise ship began to search for her. And then they would also get the authorities involved to begin searching the waters. Now, Scott's first version of the story was that Karen was on the jogging track of the cruise line. He said that the winds were so strong that they pushed Karen overboard. The problem with this is when they checked the wind speed at the time of this, it was about four miles per hour. I don't know if I need to tell you this, that's not strong wind. That's not wind that knocks anyone over. And also the ship was in very calm water, so the boat wasn't even rocking. So then Scott said, oh, well, so hold on a minute. Um, I'm sorry. Um, she actually just fell overboard. I don't, I don't know how she did it, but I, I, I found her. She was hanging on for dear life. And when I tried to go get her, she slipped and she fell. He said she must have been leaning against the railing and just fell over. The problem there is physics. Karen was fairly short. The railing was fairly high compared to her, at least. There's no way she would have just naturally flipped over. Then Scott said, well, hold on a minute, I'm something else. And he said, well, a year ago, I wrote an expose on the Israeli government. So I think I saw two Israeli people on board. So yeah, I think they, as a, as revenge, they killed my wife. A couple days later, they found Karen's body. The autopsy would show that she had a hemorrhage in her neck and her eyes were also hemorrhaging, indicating that someone had been strangling her. This also makes sense as part of her hair and one of her earrings was embedded in the jogging track on the cruise line, indicating that someone had forcefully been pressing her head against the ground. Scott Rolston was then arrested for the murder. Scott's motive isn't really clear, but he would end up being convicted of second degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Donna Anthony. Viewer discretion is advised. Donna Anthony was married to this fella, David Anthony. Donna had two children from a previous marriage. That would be Danielle Romero and Richard Romero. 
From what little I've been able to find, there was some issues in the marriage. I know Donna had some major trust issues with David. And in July of 2001, Donna was going to just take some time away with her kids while going to Ohio. Their flight to Ohio was supposed to be on July 7th, 2001, but they never landed in Ohio. They were never even at the airport. The family in Ohio was obviously very concerned because they had heard nothing from Donna. So they gave a call to the police in Peoria, Arizona, where the family lived, to ask if they could check to see if Donna was at home. When police arrived, they were met by David. He said he didn't know why they didn't land in Ohio. He also just didn't seem to give two flying sh He didn't care that they were missing. That's obviously a little on the suspicious side, don't you think? Three days later, Donna's truck would be found, and it was found in immaculate condition. It was like spotless. The only thing they found inside the truck were five fingerprints that were all Donna's. But Donna was not known to keep her truck super clean. In fact, there was usually like trash and debris in there. So something seemed off about it. A couple of days after they found the truck, they went back to the home of the family. And this time when police got there, a huge odor of like pine saw and cleaning supplies just wafted out into the street. When they were able to go inside the house, it was spotless. There was even a portion of carpet missing. Detectives were then able to get a warrant to search the home of David. And when they sprayed it down with luminol, it, as they say on the crime shows, lit up the house. They also uncovered, buried deep in the trash, the rubber gloves that were used to clean, the pine saw bottles, and two bloody knives. Usually not best to throw those away in your own home garbage, bud. Police had discovered that they had recently refinanced the house and they took out $100,000 in cash. And Donna took that cash and put it into a separate bank account that David had absolutely no access to. Police then noticed that the PIN number for that account had recently been changed. And then suddenly David was able to buy himself a new truck. With all the evidence, they were able to arrest David and charged him with three counts of murder. He was convicted and he was sentenced to death. Four years later, their bodies were discovered in barrels of acid. His conviction was then overturned and then he was convicted again. But he would die of natural causes in prison. A woman in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma would call 911 in a panic saying, My husband and I, we've been shot. But who did it? is pretty close to home. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Rob Andrew. Viewer discretion is advised. By November of 2001, Rob had been married to his wife, Brenda, for about 17 years, and the two of them had two kids together. They were a very religious family. They were very involved in the church. But eventually, there was a point in their marriage where things were just becoming rocky. Rob had begun to suspect that his wife was having an affair with another man from church, a man by the name of James Pavat. He sold life insurance. Yeah, that'll come back up. In October of 2001, Rob had called 911 because he suspected that his wife, or possibly James, or both, had cut the brake lines to his vehicle. He even told the 911 operator, that sounds like attempted murder, don't you think? So Rob would move out of the house and the marriage was essentially at the end. Now, before all of this went down, much earlier in 2001, Brenda and James had actually convinced Rob to change this sum of his life insurance policy. And this was done through James because he was a person who sold life insurance. The policy was racked up to $800,000 which was then to be left solely in Brenda's name. And then also in October, around the time of the brake lines being cut, Brenda filed for divorce. Rob tried to change the life insurance policy over to his brother, but James Pavat said, no, you can't do that. This would all come to a head on November 20th, 2001. Rob had agreed to go to the house to pick up the kids because it was his time to have them. Shortly after he gets there, that's when Brenda makes the 911 call that her husband's been shot and so has she. When police arrived, Rob had been shot dead by what appeared to be a shotgun. But they also found 22 caliber pistol bullets. It appeared Brenda had been shot with that gun. She said this was all done from far away. 
The problem being the shot on her wound had powder burn circles around it, which means she was shot at close range. They would also determine that Rob was shot at almost point blank range and not from very far away. Police in their investigation then discovered the affair. They discovered the life insurance policy. They were then reminded of the brake lines being cut. Just a few weeks after the murder, the two of them fled and they were charged with murder and now they were criminals on the run. They would both eventually get arrested in Mexico. Both went on trial for murder. Both got the death penalty where they are still awaiting their sentence. A young woman would text her brother, hey, I quit, so I'm leaving with my boyfriend, I can't do this shit. anything, I'm fine, just want to get away. The problem, when she supposedly sent this, she was already dead. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Savannah Gold. Viewer discretion is advised. Savannah was a 21-year-old woman who lived in Jacksonville, Florida. She was a lacrosse player. She loved to dance. She was described as a natural caregiver that one day she would make a phenomenal mother. And at the time of this story, in 2017, she was making ends meet by being a waitress. She was working at a restaurant called The Bonefish Grill. On August 2nd, 2017, she was scheduled to work the evening shift. When she left home, her family said that she was in great spirits, everything seemed fine, but Savannah never made it in. Something that's quite unusual for her to not call ahead of time, but it wasn't a busy day, so they just took her off the schedule and went about their business. But then two hours after she left home, her father got this text. Hey, I just wanted to tell you and mom I met a really great guy and we are running away together. I love him and we are leaving tonight. I'll call you later when we get there where we are going. A lot of spelling errors, which was also very unusual for Savannah. She then texts her brother. Hey, I quit. I'm leaving with my boyfriend. I can't do this anything. I'm fine. Just want to get away. Again, more spelling errors. Savannah's family wasn't buying this. Something was off. So they called the restaurant and they said she never showed up. Within two hours of her leaving the home, her parents reported her missing. To make matters more alarming, her vehicle was found in the parking lot of the Bonefish Grill. CCTV footage showed that she got there at 5.31 p.m. The red arrow was pointing to where she parked, and then another car pulled up kind of next to her a few spots over. The camera would then pick up Savannah getting out of her car and going into the passenger seat of that car. You can kind of see the car right back there. Police observed what looked like an altercation happening in the car. Then the car started to rock back and forth. The passenger side door opens, then closes, then opens, then closes, as if someone's trying to escape the car. And then the camera picks up a man going towards her car and doing something and then going back into the other car. That vehicle is then seen leaving the parking lot and Savannah never got out of it. Police would determine that that car belonged to Lee Rodardi. Lee, I guess, was one of the head chefs at the restaurant that Savannah worked at. So police wanted to question him. You can watch his interrogation on a JCS video on YouTube. But after telling several lies, he would end up confessing. He killed Savannah in the parking lot in his vehicle in a heat of passion sort of thing. Apparently they had an on-again, off-again relationship. He dumped her in a lake where they eventually found her, and Lee was given 40 years in prison. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Emily Ferlazzo. Viewer discretion is advised. And I also want to give you a bit of a warning just in case um, this is a story that involves domestic violence as well. Emily Jean Schwarz was born on July 25th, 1999 in Plymouth, New Hampshire. She had what her family described as a very infectious personality. She brought so much joy to a whole lot of people. She loved to sing, and one of her family members made the remark that American Idol missed out on her. She was a huge animal lover. Um, she wanted to become a cosmetologist, um, but unfortunately, all of that would never come to fruition for Emily. Emily had recently married 41-year-old Joseph Ferlazzo. At the time of this story, they had been married for just about one year. As a matter of fact, they were celebrating their one-year anniversary. Their marriage and relationship overall was riddled with one-sided domestic abuse. Emily would appear um, to her friends and family with just bruises and scratches all over her body. And I've said this time and time again on my page that domestic abuse 
victims, survivors, they, it's not easy to get out of relationships like this. It's not as simple as, well, I'm gonna go tell on you and then that's the end. They're trapped. They don't have a, a comfort zone necessarily to go to to get out of this. They'll sometimes make excuses as to how they got their injuries. Essentially, they're captors. On July 25th, 2021, the couple would leave New Hampshire to take a trip to Vermont to celebrate their one year wedding anniversary. Specifically, they went to Bolton, Vermont. They traveled in their camper. This was all on a Friday. And then Saturday morning, Joseph would go meet his sister for breakfast, but Emily wasn't with him. And then the Monday that followed, he went to Emily's parents' house and told them that in the middle of the night, they got into an argument and she stormed off and disappeared. Emily's family was like, what? So they filed a missing persons report. And then a friend of Joseph Ferlazzo would call 911 to report that his friend, Joseph, admitted to killing Emily. So Joseph was arrested. He would confess to killing his wife. He claims that they got into an argument where she was kicking and punching him. Again, he said that. He then says about 20 to 30 minutes later, he grabs his handgun, jumps on top of his wife, and shoots her twice in the head. He then drove around for 12 to 15 hours with her body in there, and then he finally dismembered her. Police would search the camper and they found her dismembered remains. He would plead not guilty and he is still awaiting trial. A man in Alaska prophesize his own murder? Well, kinda. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Kent LePink. Viewer discretion is advised. Kent was born and raised in Michigan, but he would eventually move all the way out to Alaska, where he would be a fisherman. He had kind of a rocky past. Um, there was one time where he tried to steal money from their family business. So when he decided to move to Alaska, the family was kind of hoping that this would just sort of breathe new life into him. Sadly, it would do quite the opposite. Kent would quickly strike up a relationship with a woman by the name of Michelle Linen, and they were soon living together. They also lived with two other men, Scott Hilke and John Carlin. You see, Kent was engaged to Michelle. You see, John was engaged to Michelle. You see, Scott was engaged to Michelle. <sighs> yeah. Uh, she had apparently, unbeknownst to the three of them, had agreed to marry all three of them. Eventually, her relationship with Scott Hilke would break off, and he would move out of the apartment and out of the state. Now, one day, Kent would receive a note that was dubbed the Hope Note. A note that basically told Kent he needed to go to Hope, Alaska, to find a certain cabin that Michelle was using to have relationships with other men. And then on May 2nd, 1996, two men would discover the body of Kent LePink. He had been fatally shot three times, once in the back, once in the chest, and once through the cheek. This is an image from a TV show. This is not the actual image. Clearly, this was a homicide. The exact day he was found, his parents in Michigan got a letter from him. In the letter, it stated that if anything happens to me, Michelle is the one who did it. And so did John, and so did Scott. Now, Scott Hilke, he was cleared because he was nowhere near Alaska. Police would uncover that there was a $1 million life insurance policy on Kent that he and Michelle took out just four weeks before his death. But unbeknownst to Michelle, he removed her from the policy just days before his death. So she got nothing. Police believe the Hope Note was meant to lure him out there and that John Carlin was there to execute him. He was the other roommate. So he and Michelle were arrested for his murder and they were actually convicted of it. John Carlin was murdered in prison. Michelle's conviction in 2010 was thrown out. This is because the prophecy letter, which was used in the original trial, was deemed inadmissible. Because at the absolute most, it was just some bizarre circumstantial evidence. But it was not proof of anyone's guilt. And even though I think that these two people were guilty, I, I have to agree. Because he also said a man killed him who wasn't even living in the state anymore. 
So prosecutors were given an opportunity to refile charges against her, but without the letter, with zero murder weapons, because they never found it, and with the likely shooter now dead, they had nothing to go with. Did she conspire to kill Kent? I can only say it's possible, but no one can really say it's definitive. I believe she technically can be recharged again if they found evidence. But as of now, his murder is officially unsolved. Police are confident that the victim is deceased. They know who probably did it, but unfortunately, there is still no body. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Shariah Grant. Viewer discretion is advised. Shariah was a happy 20-year-old woman living in Kilgore, Texas, and she was eight months pregnant. She worked at a restaurant called Chicken Express, and she had recently started to use all of her income to purchase stuff for the baby. You know, the essentials, clothes and diapers and food and formula. By every single account, she was thrilled to become a mother. And then suddenly, she vanished. On August 19th, 2016, shortly after midnight, no one would ever see her again. No one could get a hold of her on the phone. She wasn't answering her door. So after a couple of days, her family officially filed a missing persons report. And when they got inside of her home, they noticed that all of her stuff was still in the house. If she left on her own, she didn't tell anyone and she did not bring anything. All of the recent purchases she made for the baby, all still in her home. There was no trace of Shariah at all. Two months after she disappeared, the home she lived in caught on fire. And very shortly after this happened, her ex-boyfriend and the father of her unborn child, and also her own older sister, they were charged with insurance fraud with regards to the house. Now, police do not believe that the house on fire has any actual connection to Shariah's disappearance. Now, Shariah's ex, Alan Sutton Jr., he was dating Shariah's cousin, Lanisha Young. It was reported that Alan would constantly threaten Shariah, especially after she got pregnant. The pregnancy also pissed off Lanisha. You see, while Lanisha was in jail for something completely different, that is when Alan basically started messing around with Shariah. That's when she got pregnant. Police would end up confiscating their vehicle while they were searching for Shariah. The trunk liner, the car's car jack, and the spare tire were all missing. They also found blood inside the trunk. The blood, it matched Shariah Grant. So at this point, police presumed that she was deceased. However, they could not charge them with murder. No substantial enough evidence to prove a murder happened. But they were charged with tampering with a corpse and fabricating evidence. Both were sentenced to 10 years in prison in 2019. And finally, at the end of 2021, they were both charged with capital murder. Prosecutors think they killed her and then burned her body, but she's never been found. They are both still awaiting trial. <sighs> this poor woman was alert and awake for most of her horrific murder, and it had to be absolute hell on earth. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Trisha Stemple. Viewer discretion is strongly advised. Trisha was, oh my God. Trisha was married to this man. His name was Sean Stemple. They lived near the Tulsa, Oklahoma area. They had a daughter together. I can't seem to find a whole lot of personal information about Trisha, but from what I can see, she was described as a very loving and very vibrant woman. And she loved her daughter. On October 24th, 1996, God, you can land an airplane on that thing. Sean would call police to report that Trisha was missing. When the missing person case was first filed, it was basically discovered that Sean and Trisha did not have a very happy marriage. As a matter of fact, Sean was being unfaithful to his wife. It would not take police long to find Trisha. On the side of a highway near Tulsa, Oklahoma, police would discover the horrifically damaged body of Trisha. Her vehicle was found with the hood up. The tire had holes. It appeared she had car trouble, pulled off to the side of the road, and they thought, well, she was hit by a car. So this was treated as a hit and run case for a brief moment. 
until they saw what damage was done. Trisha had fractures in both her arms, her ribs, her pelvis, her skull, and her vertebrae. Her head was nearly crushed. The coroner would determine that her cause of death was homicidal blunt force trauma. The scene was staged to look like an accident. Witnesses would state they saw a red pickup truck near where her body was found. Sean Stemple just so happened to own a red pickup truck. Police also discovered that Trisha had a $1 million life insurance policy that he would be able to claim. Through their investigation, police would uncover a man by the name of Terry Hunt, who was the cousin to Sean's girlfriend. Police would find that he and a friend went to Walmart to purchase some baseball bats. When police questioned him, he revealed what happened. Sean had hired him to help kill his wife. Sean would call Trisha to have him meet where she was found, stating he had car trouble. When she pulled up behind his red truck, Terry Hunt came out with a metal baseball bat and began to beat her over the head. But she did not die, she did not even pass out. So then Sean took the bat and began to beat his wife. That still did not kill her, and it still did not knock her out. They forced her to the ground and then placed her head directly in the path of the truck's tires. Sean then proceeded to get into his pickup truck and attempted to drive over his wife's head, but the wheel would not go over her head. So all it did was it pushed and dragged her head and face along the asphalt of the road. She still was not dead. She had actually attempted to start crawling away at this point, so she was still alert. So Sean got back into the truck and proceeded to run over her again and ran over her chest. When he got back out, she still was not dead. So he finally took the baseball bat and began to hit her over the head, crushing her skull where finally she would succumb to the utter chaos and horror and torture, and she died. He then just left her on the side of the road like she was garbage, and he just went home. Because Terry was essentially giving all the information, he was able to take a deal um, for his testimony against Sean. So he was sentenced with this deal to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Sean here didn't get so lucky. He was convicted of capital murder and he was sentenced to death. He kept trying to go on and on about how innocent he was and he had no part of this. He appealed, he appealed, he appealed, but he lost all of his appeals. And on March 15th, 2012, he was finally executed by lethal injection. And I sincerely hope, sir, that you are not resting in peace. The failures of a college to protect their students may have led to a murder. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Lauren McCluskey. Viewer discretion is advised. 21-year-old Lauren was actually recruited by the University of Utah to be on their women's track and field team. You know, she was a top 10 athlete. She played across multiple different sports, and she was incredibly intelligent as well. Lauren was a highly respected student. Everybody loved her. She was known to be kind of introverted, but once she kind of opened up with you, she was just like a ball of fun. On September 2nd, 2018, Lauren would actually meet Melvin Rowland um, at a bar where he was a bouncer. They hit it off pretty quickly and they started to date. He would tell Lauren that he was in the military, he was a security officer, but it turns out all of that was a lie. He was actually a previously convicted felon and sexual assaulter. Once Lauren found out, she broke up with Melvin, and that was it. Oh, if only that was actually it. Because it was not. Melvin would start calling her, and then he would harass her. At one point, he bribed her that you're going to pay me $1,000 or else I'm going to release some very um, inappropriate photos of you. Melvin then faked a self-unaliving by having his friends post on Facebook that he was no longer with us. The friends who were in on all of this would put all the blame on Lauren, saying she caused this to happen. They started to harass her. Of course, quickly people would realize he was not actually dead. Lauren started to tell her parents, her friends, her family at first. When the harassment continued, she then told campus security. 
Lauren expressed she was terrified. She was afraid for her life. On October 13th, 2018, she had reported the harassment. She had reported the attempt at extortion. Campus police never investigated her claims. They never once looked into Roland or his criminal history. One of the campus officers, Miguel Darris, he had Lauren sent him the photos, the ones that Roland was threatening to expose, you know, for investigation purposes. Actually, Miguel just wanted to have the photos to share with his cop buddies. Yeah. On October 19th, 2018, Lauren emailed campus officers the criminal history of Melvin. They didn't open the email. On October 22nd, 2018, at 9.55 p.m., Lauren McCluskey was discovered in the back of her car, shot to death. She had been shot seven times. Melvin Rowland had shot her. He then took another girl out on a date. Afterwards, he went to this church and he put a bullet into his own head, taking the coward's way out. Lauren tried desperately to get help. The school failed her. Justice wasn't served. Her family sued and got $14 million. <sighs> Uh, a thrill kill, a sexual fantasy. This guy is gross. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Trenton Cornell Duran Lowe. Viewer discretion is advised. Trenton was born and raised in Michigan, but he would eventually move to Illinois. He was a beloved uh, cosmetologist. He worked at several different hair salons. He had this like infectious enthusiasm, his mother would say. He loved music, he loved animals, he was just a great, big lover of life. After moving to the Chicago area, he would end up dating this fella here. This was 45-year-old Wyndham Latham. He was actually a professor at Northwestern University in Illinois, and there he was a microbiologist. And he was about 20 years or so older than Trenton. How they came to meet, I'm not 100% sure. But at some point, Wyndham started talking to another man. This fella here, Andrew Warren, he was actually from Britain. He was a financial officer at Oxford University, and he and Wyndham struck up a, I guess, relationship, if you want, online. And at some point, they devised a plan, a weird, bizarre sexual fantasy According to Andrew, he said the initial plan was for them to stab each other um, eventually and uh, end each other's lives. That's what he says. But in reality, they were really discussing ending the life of Trenton. Andrew was a bit jealous of the relationship that Trenton had with Wyndham. In July of 2017, Andrew would fly out to Chicago to meet Wyndham. On July 27th, 2017, here at this high-rise apartment that Wyndham lived in, Trenton was there that day and he was asleep in bed. Wyndham and Andrew would then enact their fantasy. While Trenton was sleeping in bed, Wyndham took a knife and began to stab him and stab him and stab him and stab him. He would end up having over 70 stab wounds. Most of them were inflicted by Wyndham, but Andrew would admit that he too also took part in stabbing him. Trenton didn't stand a chance. Oof. The two men would then flee, knowing full well that the, at least Wyndham would be accused of the murder. And he was, immediately. They would end up fleeing to Northern California, where eventually the two men would turn themselves in. They admitted this was all a sick, thrill-kill, sexual fantasy type thing. But they would end up blaming each other for being the main culprit. Andrew got 45 years. Wyndham got 53. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Tammy Lore. Viewer discretion is advised. At approximately 6.35 a.m. on August 2nd, 1992, in this Evansville, Indiana home, a fire was reported. Evansville police officer Patrick Bradford had called in the fire when he noticed it just shortly after he got off his shift. Five minutes prior to Bradford calling in this fire, a local fireman just happened to pass by the house. There was no fire when he drove past it. So now when Evansville firemen get to the home after it's called in, 
Bradford is in the home. He says he extinguished the flames and then he found a corpse lying on a bed. And that was the body of 24-year-old Tamara Tammy Lohr. She had been working as a clerk at the county jail and she had been dating Patrick Bradford, the man who called in the fire. It was one of those back and forth, on again, off again type relationships. But at any rate, before we get more into that, Tammy was not just burned, she was also stabbed. She had multiple stab wounds on her body and was burned post-mortem. Investigators would search through the remnants of her mattress and determined that gasoline had been poured over her body, but also on the mattress itself. There was even a gasoline canister found in her room. They came to the conclusion that the person poured gasoline on the mattress and then from the doorway lit a match and threw it into the gasoline. It was also determined that the fire had literally just been started moments before the firemen had been called, which now put a ton of suspicion on good old Patrick Bradford. Now, the time of death was believed to be 11 p.m. the night before, so when police asked him about his alibi, he said he actually responded to a hit-and-run call around that same time, and he even filled out an uh, incident report. But when the person involved in the hit-and-run was questioned, they said, uh, no, that, that did not happen. I didn't interact with him. Turns out Patrick Bradford lied. He just fudged the report to create himself an alibi. Police then used CCTV camera footage from this bank to show that Patrick Bradford had just been in the area of Tammy's house 65 seconds before he called in the fire. You see, Patrick's wife, yeah, by the way, he had a wife. Well, she found out about this little affair he was having with Tammy. So he said, okay, I'll call it off. But he didn't. Tammy then allegedly threatened to tell his wife. And then she ends up dead. He was convicted and got 80 years in prison. This is the case of Barry Morphew. Cheer up, Buttercup. Around May 10th, 2020, Barry's wife, 48-year-old Suzanne Morphew, went for a bike ride, a bike ride she would never return from. Suzanne was reported missing by a neighbor. The search for Suzanne has lasted over a year, but she has not turned up. When suddenly on May 5th, 2021, Barry was arrested for the murder of Suzanne. He was charged with murder in the first degree, tampering with a deceased human body, tampering with physical evidence, and possession of a dangerous weapon. Now again, her body hasn't been found, so speculation is saying that police must know something to be able to charge him with all of these. He was also charged with attempt to influence a public servant when he- Oh, I thought it was done with you, Donnie McDaughterbanger. He mailed in a ballot for Donald Trump under Suzanne's name, saying she would have voted for him. There's no trial date yet. This is the case of Blanche Taylor Moore. Eh, that's the wrong Blanche. Ah, here we go. This is Blanche Taylor Moore. In 1952, she married James Taylor. Ah, oh, fuck. This James Taylor. <laughs> he sold furniture. In 1962, Blanche started to fuck around. She had an affair and started plowing Raymond Reed. In 1973, James Taylor died of a heart attack, and that's when Raymond and Blanche made their relationship public. In the mid-80s, Blanche sued her company Kroger for sexual harassment, which she initially settled for $275,000. Suddenly, in 1986, Raymond Reed started to get really sick. After a long stay in the hospital, he would die in 1986. Blanche was already having another affair with the Reverend Dwight Moore. In 1989, he started to get really sick. A toxicology report would show that Moore had 20 times the lethal amount of arsenic in his system. But he managed to survive. Dwight would lose feeling in his hands and feet, but, you know, he got to live. When the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation looked into the arsenic poisoning, they found out that the two men previously in her life, including her father, died somewhat mysteriously. So they exhumed the body of James Taylor and Raymond Reed. Guess what? They found lethal levels of arsenic in both men. So Blanche, the Black Widow bitch, Taylor Moore, was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon for her attempted murder of Dwight Moore. And on November 14th, 1990, Blanche was found guilty of the first-degree murder of Raymond Reed. 
The jury recommended the death penalty. The judge agreed and she was sentenced to death. Damn, f and you gonna find out, b They would drop the cases against her for Taylor and for Moore because there was no need to prosecute anymore. She's still awaiting execution. This is the case of Yardley Love. Yardley was born on July 17, 1987 in Baltimore, Maryland. By 2009, she was a student at the University of Virginia, or UVA. And Yardley was also a member of the UVA lacrosse team. This is George Hughley, who was born on September 17, 1987. While at the Landon School, an all-boys school in Bethesda, Maryland, he was an All-American lacrosse player. During his senior year, he was the quarterback for the football team. Is it just me, or is lacrosse a really silly looking sport? I mean, don't get me wrong, there's no chance in hell I could ever play this thing. My fat ass would have heart failure within three seconds of playing, or I'd somehow get stuck in a little tiny net. Anyway, in 2007, Hughley was charged with underage possession of alcohol in Florida. In 2008, this stand-up fellow was arrested for public drunkenness and resisting arrest. Police had to tase him in order to subdue the man. For this, he got a suspended sentence of 60 days and six months of probation. I have high hopes for him, I think. I think he's gonna do well in the story. Yardley and George would meet their freshman year, but they were always seen together. By 2010, they'd already been dating for about two years. However, there were multiple claims that George went off his rocker when he drank alcohol, and he had very aggressive behavior towards Yardley. In 2009, he attacked one of his own lacrosse teammates when he found out he was flirting with Yardley. In the days leading up to May 3rd, 2010, George would send some pretty harassing and almost violent emails to Yardley. At 2.15 a.m. on May 3rd, 2010, the police were called to Yardley's apartment. She was found face down in a pool of blood, unconscious, in her living room. When her roommate called 911, they implied that it was some sort of alcohol overdose, but there were very obvious signs of physical trauma to her head. She would be pronounced dead at the scene. Naturally, George Hughley became suspect number one, and he also lived right next door. The following day on May 4th, Hughley would be arrested and charged with her murder. And he actually waived his Miranda rights and started talking right away. You see, they had already broken up. He didn't take it so well. On that fateful evening, he kicked in her bedroom door. He then grabbed her and shook her violently, which then slammed her head against the wall repeatedly. He then stole her laptop computers, clothing items. He would say that her death was not intended, it was just a huge accident. Right. He would go- <laughs> <laughs> He looks like a deflated sumo wrestler! Jigglypuff? Is that right? Him. He's a murderer. He was convicted of second-degree murder and was sentenced to 23 years in prison. No chance of parole. He will be released on May 30th, 2030, when he is 42 years old. This is the case of 46-year-old Texas socialite Doris Angleton. She was born as Rose McGowan in the Lake Jackson, Texas area. And fast forward to 1976, she would meet a man named William Beck. They quickly got hitched and they moved to Clear Lake City. This is when she would meet Robert Angleton. Ow, oh, wow. What? Robert here was a bookkeeper. And not really one of the honest ones. But he would bring in about $2 million a year. And eventually he would become an informant for the Houston Police Department, writing out his rival bookkeepers. You son of a d rat piece of sh- <clears throat> Sorry about that. Stitches get stitches, b Moving on. While both of these two were married, they would begin plowing each other. American love, isn't it beautiful? Well, they would go on to divorce their spouses, and then the two of them would get married. Yeah, that seems backwards. So, 1982, they get married, and by 1984, they had twins. Oh no, they had blurry face twins. I don't think there's a cure for that, mm-mm. But by 1997, Doris would tell her friends and family that, you know what, I'm just not so happy in my marriage anymore. And this is when, Oh, for f sakes. Doris would start using AOL message boards and she was chatting for fuck. Come on, do your thing. Oh my God, this was life back then. She's, are you sending a signal to the sun? What's going on? She would begin an online affair. Jesus Christ. That was the internet back in the day, young people. It took six and a half hours to internet. 
Anyway, in 1997, she filed for divorce against Robert. And she wanted 50% of the assets. Uh -oh. Robert would actually offer her half of his purported estate, which is about $1.5 million worth. But she was like, mm, nah, b there's more. Well, suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, on April 16th, 1997, Doris would drive her husband and their kids to a softball game for one of the daughters. She then said, I have to go home and get a special bat, but she never got back to the field. When they got back to the home, the door was ajar. So Robert called police immediately. When they walked in, they saw Doris's body. Doris was shot 13 times, and of course the husband was the first suspect. But then Robert's brother Roger was arrested on unrelated charges. He was found with two guns and a suitcase full of crazy letters saying he was the one to kill Doris. However, the authorities could find no way of linking Roger to Robert in this murder. Robert had an airtight alibi. He was arrested and charged and went to trial, but he was found completely not guilty. Roger, while in custody, ended his own life, and even though he had a rocky history with his brother, said he had no involvement in the murder at all. This is the case of Samuel Borntrager. Samuel and his wife Anna and their four kids were living in Amish country back in 2006. And specifically, this was in Bethany, Missouri. Now, I can't find a gosh darn picture of Anna because the technology is from the devil. So here's a stock photo of an Amish lady doing whatever it is Amish people do. Well, she started to get really, really ill in March of that year. Her illnesses kept getting worse and worse and worse until eventually she just died. I guess Samuel didn't consider it that much of a tragedy because he remarried within a year and moved to Kentucky to another Amish community. He moved with the five kids he had with Anna and then the five more kids he had with the new lady. Jesus, bud. Out of nowhere in 2016, Samuel goes to police in Kentucky and says, I killed my wife, Anna. He confessed he started poisoning her with Tylenol and then eventually any freeze. He confessed because of whatever something about God. He got 25 years. This is the case of Jordan Graham. On June 30th, 2013, 22-year-old Jordan Graham would marry her boyfriend, 25-year-old Cody Johnson. Eight days later, he's dead. Around July 7th, 2013, Jordan claimed she got text messages from her new husband that he was out with a friend, but he never came home. He would be reported missing on July 8th. Jordan says it's normal for her and her husband to delete their text messages every day, so she couldn't show the text to prove it. On July 12th, 2013, Cody's body would be recovered from Glacier National Park. It appeared he had fallen off a very steep ledge. Then on July 16th, she changed her story. She said, we were hiking at Glacier National Park, we got into an argument, I pushed him and he accidentally fell. But then detectives would uncover the fact that she was extremely nervous about having sex with Cody and she was having cold feet after the wedding. She was then charged with second degree murder and got 30 years. Extra, extra, read all about it. Huntress of Lonely Hearts arrested. Her two children are known as accomplices. Lonely hearts lead to lonely murders. Brace yourselves for the wild story. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of the Lonely Heart family. Our story begins in 1948. A man by the name of Hugo Scholes responds to a Lonely Hearts ad. To those who don't know, Lonely Hearts was like, uh, kind of like Tinder, I guess. Just in the newspapers. A newspaper is basically like an iPhone if it were made out of paper. Capiche? You on board now? This is Inez Brennan. She was the ringleader. She put in the ad that Hugo Scholes would respond to. She was residing in Delaware. So he picked up all of his belongings and he moved on out to meet his lovely bride-to-be. Why do you look so frumpy, ma'am? It's not a good look. Hugo would move to her farm on Horse Pond Road. Well, then suddenly, Inez here and her two boys, Robert and Raymond, 15 years old and 17 years old, well, they pick up and they move to Hugo's old farm back in New Hampshire. But Hugo isn't there. You see, that's because Mama Brennan here, well, first she tried to put five sleeping pills in uh, Hugo's food. It didn't work. Then she tried putting arsenic in his soup. It didn't work. So she pulled out a gun and shot him. Then her and her two boys put his body in a barrel. They did all of this back in Delaware. They brought the barrel with his body back to New Hampshire where they then buried him in the pig farm. Yum. Later that same year, Ice Cold Inez puts out another Lonely Hearts ad when Mr. Wayne Woolridge, a pretty old man at the time, he responds and says, Woo, I got myself a lucky lady. 
Did I say me self? Eh, leave it in. Even I have flaws. Way too many. After just a couple of days of living with Inez, she tried her old tricks of poisoning him. Didn't work, she's really bad at that. So instead of her doing it herself, she commands her 15 year old son, Robert, to shoot him in the back of the head. He does. And then again, her two boys throw him in the pig farm. Raymond never took part of any of the actual murdering. Well, Inez here, in 1949, she decided, guess what, we're gonna sell the farm. And so when they did that, back to the boys, they dug up the bodies, what was left of them, and they burned them to ashes. This is when neighbors took notice of their very odd behavior. They contacted authorities. Robert was questioned by the police, and he immediately caved in. He confessed to everything. He even confessed to a third murder that wasn't involved with Inez. Raymond backed up the story. All three were arrested. Robert and Inez convicted and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Raymond was convicted of much lesser charges and got a much lighter sentence. All right. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Jack Wayne Reeves. And with three names, what do you want to bet he's a killer? And as usual, viewer discretion is advised. Good old Jackie boy here was born on June 20th, 1940. Damn, you an old man. He was born in Wichita Falls, Texas. Yeehaw! Stop it. He started serving in the United States Army in the early 60s and would retire from the Army in 1985. Oh, my birth year! That means you're extra old as shit, dude. You're not listening. In 1958, Jack married his first wife. He was 18, she was 15. But it didn't last long, I wonder why. And that marriage ended in 1960. In 1961, he married Sharon Vaughn. And in 1967, when Sharon and Jack were living in Italy, because that's where he was stationed at the time, he thought a local man was spying on him and his wife. So Jack pulled out a gun and he said he shot up in the air. But the Italian man was shot dead. Jack claims it ricocheted off of some like metal beams and that's how it hit him. Jack was actually convicted of manslaughter, but he only served six months. Jack and Sharon would have two sons, Ricky and Randall. Sounds like a Saturday morning cartoon name. Well, in 1977, Sharon had an affair. And by February of 78, she filed for divorce. And she did so when Jack was out in South Korea. On July 20th, 1978, Sharon, well, she died of a shotgun wound to the chest. That was actually ruled as a suicide at first. Now, fast forward real quick to 1994 when Jack was being investigated for another crime, which we'll get to. They tested this theory that Sharon might have shot herself. I had to mark out the weapon, of course, because, you know, TikTok. But where this police officer's foot is, is where they're trying to have her pull the trigger. But it was impossible. She couldn't do it. So then Sharon's death was ruled a homicide. In 1980, Jack married his third wife, Myung Hyoi Chung, in South Korea. In 1986, she died in Lake Whitney in Texas by drowning. Her family would say that she doesn't even know how to swim, so she strongly avoided water, but he was never investigated for her death. Jack then met Emilita Villa from the Philippines, and then this was a mail-order bride type thing. She got pregnant. Jack didn't think it was his, so he sent her back to the Philippines. He saw a picture and said, okay, maybe he is mine. Well, too late. She wanted to divorce him. She was last seen alive on October 11th, 1994. In October of 1995, her remains were found near the lake where his third wife died. So he was charged for two murders, and he was convicted of both. Jack received 99 years in prison. Mm. You ain't gonna make it. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Jennifer Dulos. Jennifer was born on September 27th, 1968, and at the time of this case, she was living in New Canaan, Connecticut. Jennifer had a master's degree in writing which she got from New York University Tisch School for the Arts. She had her own blog, but she also wrote for Patch.com. And when she wasn't doing that, she was a stay-at-home mom to her five kids. Her children included two sets of twins, who all have very interesting Greek-inspired names. Petros, Theodore, Constantine, Christiane, and Cleopatra Noel. Pretty cool. She had those five children with Photis Doulos who actually grew up in Athens, Greece, hence the names of the children. Fotis ran a real estate development that specialized in like, you know, hoity-toity, la-di-da, luxury type homes. 
he did very well for himself. Hence the holy sh** this house. Jesus. Could you even imagine living in a house like that? Ugh. One day my prince will come and pay for a house like that and let me live in it forever. And then I'll get a life insurance policy. Oh, stop. Actually, I believe this is the home that Jennifer Dulos moved into after she filed for divorce. Because she did so in 2017. She had written in a blog that she was sort of scared of confrontation and hinted that her marriage just wasn't going so great. So her and her five children moved into this home. In her divorce papers, she wrote, and I quote, I know that filing for divorce and filing this motion will enrage him. I know he will try to retaliate by harming me in some way. End quote. She also suspected he was having an affair, which he was, with a colleague of his, Michelle Traconis. Traconis. That sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Traconis! I don't know what I just did to you, man, but I hope it hurts. <laughs> just kidding. Jennifer was last seen alive at 8 o'clock in the morning on May 24th, 2019. She dropped the kids off at school, and then she could be seen on a neighbor's CCTV camera at about 8.05 a.m. She missed all of the appointments she had that day, and her friends finally filed a missing persons report on her that evening. When they went to her home, her vehicle was still in the garage. They found blood in the kitchen, her blood, and also Fotis's blood. And there was enough evidence there to confirm that she was the victim of some sort of assault, even though she was missing. Fotis and Traconis, whoa, should I just curse someone? They were caught on CCTV footage disposing of garbage bags that police would discover had bloodied items in them and used cleaning supplies. And Fotis's DNA was found on one of the gloves inside those garbage bags. This couple was arrested for tampering with evidence and hindering prosecution. They were also charged with conspiracy to commit murder, but then Fotis ended his own life. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Marianne Lawrenson. Marianne was a 24-year-old single mother of a five-year-old girl living in Kent, Washington. She worked as a fitness trainer, but she was also a model. Both her and her daughter, Jade, um, they had modeling contracts with Seattle Models Guild and the Colleen Bell Modeling and Talent Agency. Marianne wanted to become, you know, a runway model, possibly even an actress. She could even sing. She was very multi-talented. On March 4th, 2007, um, Marianne would tell a friend that she felt like she was being stalked, in, in particular by a man who had tried to sexually assault her before. From what I can find out, I, I guess she was thinking about taking, you know, Jade, her daughter, um, to California to kind of get away, you know, for safety. Now, the friend who she told this information to wanted to keep his name secret and private, because at the time, the person who was potentially stalking Marianne said, if you tell anyone, I might, you know, I'll kill your male friends. But on March 9th, 2007, Marianne Lawrenson would be found dead on the living room floor of her apartment. She had been stabbed more than 30 times. She was stabbed in the head, the chest. It appeared to be a very personal and very brutal attack. Her five-year-old daughter, Jade, was not at the apartment at the time because she was with her father. The night she was killed, she had just left her current boyfriend's apartment, and she had made her final cell phone call around 10 p.m. that night. Leading up to her murder, she would tell friends that she was afraid of a man named Randy, which police would quickly find out was her ex-boyfriend, Randall Edward Connor. He and Marianne had been dating off and on since 2005. At one point, Lawrenson would say that he handcuffed her and physically assaulted her. And she told her friends that, you know, if anything kind of mysterious happened, if I fall out of touch, then that means something is wrong and it's probably Randy. Police would use his cell phone records to determine that he was at her apartment the night she was murdered. Randall had actually served time at Pelican Bay State Prison for armed robbery. He had served six years and then was released in 2004. He had been brought back to California several times because he violated his parole. And at the time of the murder, he had been out of jail for about two months because he had violated his parole. Marianne was done with them. They were breaking up. Randy didn't like that. So he did the cowardly thing and he ended the life of a beautiful young single mother. In 2011, Randall was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to 32 years in prison.
Way too short, if you ask me. Rest in peace, Marianne. Hello, true crimers. Before we begin this video today, I do want to give a pretty stern trigger warning. If you are a survivor of domestic abuse, this may not be the video for you to watch. It's a tough story to listen to, and I'm going to show some pretty triggering images. So, with that in mind, this is the case of Tatian Spitzner. Viewer discretion is advised. In Brazil, one out of every three women has suffered some form of domestic violence. Women are killed at the rate of 4.4 women per 100,000. At the time of this story, Tatian Spitzner was a 29-year-old lawyer in Brazil. She was married to this... thing. 32-year-old Luis Manweiler. He was a lecturer in biology at a university. Several months before the story took place, Tatian had sent some text messages to friends of hers saying that she was afraid of her husband. She described it that he had been mistreating her. From the outside looking in, it appeared that they were in a very happy, very loving relationship. But appearances, as we all know, can be very deceiving. But unfortunately, when women are involved in domestic violence, when they're being abused, it's not a simple process just getting out of it. You know, it's not as simple as like, uh, I'm leaving you, goodbye. When the reality is, is they're trapped. They are terrified to leave. They feel like a prisoner. On the night of July 22nd, 2018, the abuse against Tatian would come to a very tragic end. I am about to show images that may be distressing to some people, so just a heads up. This is the first of one of many CCTV images that are online showing where the abuse began this night. Pictured here in this car, you can actually see the man slapping the woman. There are other images where the man, who is Luis, is forcibly removing Tatian from the car. But here you can literally see her trying to run away from him. This is another haunting image of that same thing. He manages to grab her and yank her into the elevator. And this is in their apartment building, by the way. And then there are 15 minutes that are not captured on camera because they're in their apartment. In that 15 minutes, neighbors are hearing blood-curdling screams for help. They all call the police and try to get them there as soon as possible. However, several moments later, Tatian's body falls from their fourth floor balcony and lands on the ground below. Luis is then caught on the elevator camera again in distress. He's later seen trying to clean up blood. There's blood all over his shirt, blood all over their apartment. He tried saying she jumped herself, but she was actually strangled to death. And then he threw her over the balcony. Luis would be arrested and charged with her murder. He would be convicted of her murder and was sentenced to just under 32 years in prison. Hello, true crimers. This is the case of Lori Hacking. And Lori was married to Mark Hacking. Mark would get his undergraduate degree from the University of Utah. And in 2004, they were getting ready to move. Well, because Mark here was about to start medical school in North Carolina. Specifically at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. But just before 11 a.m. on July 19th, 2004, Mark would call the police and say that his wife is missing. Mark would tell the police that his 27-year-old wife, who he also alleges was five weeks pregnant, was just out on her jog that she goes on every single day, but that she never came home, and that's extremely unusual. So police began their search. They also began investigating the husband, because, you know, that's the first person you look to. Well, Mark, Mark, Mark. Turns out, Mark here is a good old-fashioned, genuine, lying son of a bee. Because he never actually got his undergraduate degree, and he was never going to medical school, he hadn't even applied. Sometime after his wife went missing, Mark, I don't know why, was running through the streets of his neighborhood, buck naked. So the police intervened and he was admitted into a mental hospital. And given the situation with Lori, he also obtained a defense attorney. On August 2nd, 2004, Mark Hacking would be arrested under suspicion of killing his wife. They believed he killed her with a 22 caliber rifle that he owned. They found blood in the apartment they lived in. It was on the walls and the headboard of their bed and also on a knife. And also, Lori's car. 
His brothers, Scott and Lance, would come forward to police saying that Mark confessed to killing Lori. On October 1st, 2004, police searchers would find human remains at a nearby landfill. They found two human teeth and a part of a shoulder blade bone. They also found a carpet that used to belong to the hackings that Mark confessed to his brothers he rolled her up in. So allegedly, Lori found out about Mark's lies about school. In the note, she said, that's it, we're done, I'm leaving you. But Mark didn't want to go through the embarrassment of a divorce. I guess he'd rather go through the embarrassment of a murder trial. You're a psychopath, sir. F*** Mr. Clean wannabe piece of shit. On April 15th, 2005, this piece of shit would plead guilty. Guilty to first degree murder. He was sentenced six years to life. But the parole board said they won't even consider his case until he serves at least 30 years. Drop the soap, shiny head. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Emma Walker. Emma was a 16 year old high school girl who was living with her parents in Knoxville, Tennessee. On the morning of November 21st, 2016, her mother would go into her room to wake her for school. Emma had actually asked her mom to wake her up a little bit earlier that day because she wanted to do her hair. 6.15 that morning, her mom went into the room and tried to wake her, but she couldn't do it. She called her name, she, you know, nudged her, nothing. She was laying on her back with her face up. Her mother then checked her pulse and there was none. So the police were called and when they got there, they would pronounce Emma dead. They would find a bullet hole next to her bed and another bullet wedged in the pillow on her bed. They would determine that Emma Walker died while she slept from a bullet that struck her in the head behind her left ear. Her death was instant. No one in the house had heard shots, but she had been dead for at least several hours. Police then immediately began to question who would want to shoot Emma, who would want her dead. It was an easy answer for most people. They would point the finger at her on-again, off-again 18-year-old boyfriend, William Riley Gall. Police would learn that Riley, as he likes to be called, was extremely possessive of Emma. He would constantly text her and text her and text her, harassing her, and her parents finally had enough. They would tell her that Riley, he ain't welcome here anymore. You can't talk to him anymore. He had a flair for the dramatic as well. The Friday night before her death, Emma was at a house party celebrating a football game victory. And she got texts from an anonymous number. One that read, come outside if you don't want to see a loved one get hurt. And another, go to your car with your keys. Go alone. I've got someone you love and if you don't comply, I will hurt them. Emma and her friend Zach would go outside and find uh, Riley here face down in a ditch. He concocted this huge story that he was kidnapped but literally no one believed him. That Saturday night, Emma was home alone. She saw a man in a black hoodie walking up and down the street that then rang her doorbell. Frightened, of course, she texts Riley and said, listen, I don't want to be with you, but I need you right now. I'm scared. So he came over. He came over and then by the next day he left. And then 24 hours later, she would be dead. Riley told his friend that he had a gun that he needed to get rid of because then he thinks the police would say, oh, you killed Emma because you have the same gun that shot her. So his friend wore a wire for the cops. And when Riley went to go retrieve the gun, they arrested him. You see what he did that night? He knew where her bedroom was and knew where she slept. And if he couldn't have her, no one could. So he fired outside through the wall and managed to actually shoot and kill her. He was sentenced to life in prison, paroled after 51 years. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Angelique Lynn Sylvester. Now, unfortunately, I don't have really any pictures for this case. Angelique lived in Greensboro, North Carolina with her boyfriend. Jesus. 46-year-old Donald Thomas Johnson. Now, they had actually been together for 10 years at this point. But Angelique would be reported missing on July 8th, 2013. And it was her mother who reported her missing. Now, from this point moving forward, I just want to say viewer discretion is advised. This story, um, it's going to be pretty graphic. On July 12th, near the property, in a trash bin, a dismembered human body would be discovered. It would be determined to be the body of 38-year-old Angelique Sylvester. 
Her remains were in multiple trash bags. Her head was severed at the neck. Each arm was severed from just below the shoulder. Her right arm was cut again near her elbow. Her left hand was removed at the wrist. Both legs were severed just above the kneecaps. The right foot was cut off. They also found a blue rope tied near one of her legs. The remains did have um, tattoos, which is how they would identify her remains as being her, and also because of dental records. Donald Johnson would of course be arrested, and about a year later he would plead guilty to her murder. What he said was that they got into an argument on uh, July 2nd, 2013. He then tied her up and put her into a tent outside. He would put a zip tie around her neck, which would make it impossible for her to talk. He would go out to ask her questions and she could only blink her answers. And then one day he said he just went out there and she was dead. The autopsy would show that there was no like significant trauma done to her that would cause her death, like a gunshot wound, blunt force trauma, etc. They believe her cause of death would be from asphyxiation due to the ligatures around her throat. So basically, Donald was just an absolute psychopath who... I, I, what? He was just so casual about it. When she dies, like, oh, I guess I'll just chop her up. Who has this, like evil or whatever you want to call it in them i don't th i don't think i'll ever understand this poor woman suffered probably for a couple of days and then he just threw her away like you would do your regular trash i just don't get it rest in peace angelique